if nature could speak, if nature could speak, I've been looking after you since the beginning of time. I've given you water, I've given you oxygen, I've given you the soil to grow your food. I even regulate the climate by capturing all that carbon dioxide from the atmosphere so you can have a good life. You probably know about my forests and my trees. They too grab a lot of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. But do you also know about my animals? My animals also grab a lot of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. The, the elephants in the forests of Africa through the way they walk, through the way they forage, they eat a lot, they poop a lot. All of that activity enhances carbon sequestration in the trees between 7 and 14%. Just imagine these elephants just going about their daily lives. They're great allies in the fight against climate change. but I'm interested in getting you to hear me. So perhaps I should use the language that you've chosen, language of dollars and cents. So I'm going to value for you the service of my elephant in dollars and cents, because perhaps if I were to do that, you would finally listen to me. So if we are to pay this elephant, this, the value of her services of grabbing carbon on behalf of humanity throughout her lifetime, we would have to pay her at least $2.3 million. $2.3 million. But that same elephant, as we speak today, is being poached, killed, taken away from its family, and sold for the ivory, which fetches a maximum of 30,000. A living, thriving elephant, frolicking freely as nature deemed it to be, this value of her services to us is $2.3 million just in carbon sequestration. A dead elephant barely fetches 40,000. Can you hear me? But it's not only about the forests and the elephants. You should see what my oceans do. They're amazing. Those oceans have also been looking after you since time immemorial. These oceans are huge carbon sinks. In the oceans, there are these microscopic organisms called phytoplankton. They do something amazing. They breathe just like you and me, except that they take in carbon dioxide and they emit oxygen. How much carbon dioxide do they emit annually? The equivalence of four Amazon forests. Four Amazon forests. Closer to shore, I have my seagrass, my salt marsh, my mangroves, my kelp forests, my wetlands. These two are living systems that grab so much carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and sequester it in the sediments. But they also do other things. They're great barriers against flooding. And when they're healthy, fish stocks increase. Seagrass alone, so that you would hear me better, if we were to value the carbon sequestration service of seagrass globally, the value is over three trillion dollars. Seagrass. Seagrass that, as I'm speaking to you, is being lost to new marinas or developments or simply because the tourists don't like their feet to touch seagrass. So you see the resorts in the morning chopping away at seagrass. Can you hear me? In the ocean, there are these magnificent beings called the whales. These great whales 
aside from them being majestic, they do something incredible. They grab carbon on their body. How much carbon? On average, nine tons of carbon. That's equivalent to 33 tons of carbon dioxide being kept out of the atmosphere. And when these whales die, because they're so heavy, they sink to the bottom of the ocean, where that carbon is sequestered forever. How much carbon is on the, on the single whale, if you like, on the body? Is equivalent to 1,500 trees. But the whales, my whales, do something really even more magnificent. They like to eat krill. They eat a lot of krill. And when they eat a lot, they poop a lot. But that poop is amazing because in it, there's nitrogen, there's phosphorus, and there's iron. And those nutrients fertilize the phytoplankton. So the whales eat the krill, the krill feeds on the phyto, and the phyto needs the poop of the whale, of my whale, to thrive. So more phyto, more carbon being, carbon dioxide being absorbed from the atmosphere. Such that one whale, one of my whales, in terms of her work over her lifetime, how much carbon dioxide she sequesters from the atmosphere, one whale is equivalent to thousands of trees. Now, let me put it in your language, the language of dollars and cents. Perhaps you'll hear me better. If we were to pay this whale a salary for her lifetime of work, of grabbing carbon on behalf of humanity, we would have to pay her at least $3 million. At least. Now, I want you to contrast that with what's happening to my whales. As I'm speaking to you today, the whales are being hit by ships, or their eardrums are being blown out by seismic testing in the ocean, or they're being caught by gnats, or in some places, unfortunately, they chop them to pieces and they sell them as meat, and their meat is really not good for you. But that meat fetches a maximum of $40,000. A dead whale, 40000 a living whale thriving, frolicking freely in the ocean gives you, gives humanity a service worth at least $3 million. Perhaps you can hear me now. Even the open ocean, the open ocean, that's the part of the ocean belongs to no one. Therefore, it belongs to all of us. That ocean has been grabbing carbon, sinking it to the bottom of the ocean forever. Since you've kept data on the ocean from 1870 to today, the ocean has sequestered roughly 500 gigatons of carbon dioxide below 1,000 meters. And anything below 1,000 meters is sequestered forever unless you dredge the ocean or you excavate in the ocean, or you mine that ocean, then that carbon will surely rise up to the atmosphere. In your language, that carbon is worth $30 trillion. So as you can see, my flora, my fauna, green or blue, is incredibly valuable to you. You need to look after me. You need to protect me. You need to help me rejuvenate so I can continue to look after you. In any case, I have the right to exist just as you because I too am a living system. They say once you see the light, you can no longer walk in darkness. So now we as humans, we hear nature saying, I'm so valuable to you. How come is it that we can't hear nature? Actually, we do hear nature, but only when it's dead, only when it's excavated, only when it's pulled out of the ocean, fried on a pan and fed. We do not value a living nature. That's because our economic system, our current system that we practice, places a value of zero 
on a living whale, on a living tree. Cut the tree, sell it as timber, it acquires a value. So where's the problem? The problem is the current system, the current economic system is the wrong paradigm because it treats nature as external to us. Therefore, we can ex excavate it, we can pollute it, we can take stuff from it with impunity and get away with it. And what we're finding out, that is not so. That's why we are facing twin risks, climate risk and the loss of nature and biodiversity. But how do we get out of this predicament? Well, the, the solution is in front of us. If we look after nature, nature will look after us. How much? Well, the, the latest IPCC report says nature can reduce climate change or reduce the carbon sequestration, uh, reduce carbon from the atmosphere by at least 38%. So we have a plan of action. Let's look after nature. Let's make nature, living nature, thriving nature, front and center of our economic paradigm. We get a thriving nature, and then nature returns that favor by continually reducing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and the risk of climate change. So time is short. We know that. Everybody's telling us. So what must we do? What is the plan of action? It's very simple, actually. The whole world has made commitments for carbon zero, carbon negative, carbon neutral by 2050, 2060, 2040, 2030. That means there's a tremendous demand for reducing carbon emissions and draining the carbon from the atmosphere. That is the demand. Where will the supply come from? Nature is in front of us. Nature saying, let me help you. So the world that has living nature, the communities, indigenous people that are sitting on that natural capital or nature, can lease the services of their nature to those that are demanding it. So companies that are saying, we need to go carbon zero, carbon negative by a certain date, will pay. What is the price today of a ton of carbon on the European ETS? $100 per ton. They will pay those that are sitting on that natural capital, be it flora or fauna, blue or green. And the money will go to do two things. To look after nature in perpetuity. To protect it, rejuvenate it, restore it. And also to look after the stewards of nature who are the indigenous people and the local communities whose lives and fate are intertwined with nature. Who wins from this? Everyone. Watch this. That money goes in to look after nature in perpetuity. So nature thrives because we can only benefit from this if nature is rejuvenated, regenerated. Nature is looked after. The people that are leasing the services of nature, never selling nature, leasing the services, they get the money, they get the jobs, they get to be stabilized on their land. When you, we create resilience in nature, we create resilience in the people. Who else benefits from this? The governments, because that money is going to flow into the economy. So the tax base expands, tax revenue goes up. Fiscal stance of the government will change. Net worth will change. Their ratings will change. Their debt sustainability will positively impact it. And those that are buying the service, those that are paying for it, will get to say on their website, I hit my carbon target, but I more did a lot more than that. I enhanced the score of my environment, governance. I hit the SDG scores, 1, 3, 5, 8, 10, 13, 14, 15. They get to put all of that on their website. So the buyers win, the sellers win, nature wins, stewards of nature win. 
there are no losers in this society. Can we do this? Well, we are doing this. We're doing it in the Caribbean with seagrass and mangroves. We're doing it in Africa through the sale of the services of the elephants. We're doing it in Scotland in, with peatland. We're doing it in the Everglades of the U.S. through the mangroves. When we talk about new humanism, all that it means, at least to me, is that we need to come home to nature, because nature is our home. When nature thrives, we thrive. When nature is stressed, we're going to feel it. And we need to come home while we still have time. Nature is always welcoming. But we need to come home not the way we left home. We need to come home more humble and much wiser. Basically, if we stand up for nature, then nature will continue to stand up for all of humanity as it has done so from the beginning of time. Thank you.